Greetings, race community. Brent coming in live from Newport Beach, California. Most of you are probably listening on audio, but if you happen to catch this on YouTube, you will see that I just had to record today's episode outside because the setting is too good not to. It's Thanksgiving week. It's Giving Tuesday. There's a lot going on, and it is a privilege to be welcoming Ray Earl Jackson, Senior Director of Advancement at Northern Illinois University, to the show. Welcome, Ray. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. Good to be here. Now, I should have noted, in addition to being a Senior Director of Advancement, Ray is a 40 Under 40 nominee, uh, an honoree by, uh, by the Evertrue community, and he is also the co-founder of the greatest barber shop in Hammond, <laughs> Indiana. So at a time when uh, self cuts are uh, all the rage, including the one that I had to give myself and my kids this week, I, I want to know more about the greatest barber shop. But uh, why don't you first just uh, tell our audience who you are, where you grew up uh, and what led you down this path? Yeah, that's uh, it's funny you picked up on that on my LinkedIn. It's one of the things I just can't bring to myself to remove I'm no longer a, a you know a part of that uh, that enterprise but uh, I grew up in the south suburbs of Chicago um, you know um, one of six kids um, you know parents worked very hard actually both in the nonprofit sector themselves more more so in the area of uh, working with uh, special needs adults and children um, and so I kind of had an early foray into you know kind of the nonprofit sector. And uh, yeah, so uh, I, I went to school at Benedictine University and um, became a fun Time out. caller. One of, one of six kids. I mean, <laughs> there's got to be just an epic story or two that uh, around the holidays your family has to bring back. So any, any stories of the siblings? Anybody deserve a shout out right now? Oh, gosh. I mean, all my siblings. Uh, yeah, we, we're still pretty close. We still have our family text message uh, that we, you know, are communicating pretty daily on. Yeah, I can't think of any, you know, one particular story uh, from, you know, our holiday time, but, you know, some of the best memories of my life, just uh, being with my brothers and sisters and my mom and dad always making the holidays, you know, really special and house was never empty. I could tell you that much. So Thanksgiving will be a little unique for me and my wife this year with the uh, a little bit of an empty house, but you know we're looking forward to 2021 celebrating in, in, in a big way. We have not made plans with my family, but I feel you. It's it's you know strange not having everybody getting together. But will you all do any kind of group Zoom call or a group FaceTime or just kind of connect with each other one on one? I mean, any plans on that front? It's definitely already been talked about. You know, as soon as we put the kibosh on the in person Thanksgiving, the next text the next text text literally was who's setting up the Zoom chat. So. We'll be doing that and uh, it won't be the same, but you know, it'll be the next best thing. So you, uh, you made your way to Benedictine and were a student athlete. Correct. Mm -hmm. Played football was, there uh, all four years. Was football part of what drove you there or kind of what was your college selection process like? And tell us a little bit about Benedictine. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, it did actually drive me there. You know, I knew I always wanted to go to college and a lot of my friends at the time were going to Illinois State or U of I or, you know, many to Northern. Um, yeah, but, you know, I knew I wanted to play football. Um, I could have possibly tried to, you know, walk on at one of those institutions. Uh, would I have played? Probably not. And I was, you know, being recruited from some of the smaller schools with the allure that uh, you know, you could come here and you'll, you'll likely play, you know, all four years. And so uh, I wish I could tell you that Benedictine's strong academic reputation was, you know, the main pull for me at the time. But, you know, as the 18 year old kid, I just wanted to keep playing. And, you know, a great side effect, I guess, was a, a good uh, academic experience. So went to Benedictine, uh, Roman Catholic uh, institution, really grounded in those Roman Catholic uh, traditions and values. Um, you know, had the opportunity to study things like uh, the baptism of Europe or, you know, um, the, the, the spread of Christianity, to, you know, across the continent as my foundations, but uh, also studied communication arts. So I was very focused in advertising, TV production, writing, public relations, things like that. And I think that was probably the first time I really learned how to craft a unique message for, a, a, for an audience. And that's really you know, kind of carried me, I think, throughout my career. 
And early on in that journey uh, as a student, my understanding is you, like many uh, raised podcast guests, uh, first got exposure to the uh, higher ed philanthropic, uh, you know, fundraising process by way of your student caller role. Is that is that right? That is totally right. I I've said this before, and I will say it, you know, again and again and again. I think one of the best jobs on a college campus is a student phonathon caller. You know, both in terms of the experience you get as a student, you know, um, and the skills that you learn and that you take with you into almost any career career that you'll go into. So I got a chance to start doing that the second semester of my freshman year and uh, stayed on in the summers to, you know, do some data entry type stuff, uh, gift processing, helped analyze some of the, uh, you know, the data from the prior year, prep for the next year. Uh, so really got a deep dive into kind of all things annual giving uh, at a very, you know, early, early stage. Any memorable uh, student calling conversations? I mean, it's been a while, but do, <laughs> does anything stand out, either good or bad? I, you know, I can remember, I don't know if it was, you know, my first call, it feels like it would have been my first call, but it probably wasn't, but it was one of those early calls and, you know, you're doing all your mock, uh, your mock calls as a student caller before you really go live, right? They want to make sure you're not crazy and everything. Um, but uh, one of those calls, I was just so ready. I had my notes jotted down. I knew what the person gave to and their affinity. I was just so ready to, you know, uh, secure that gift and, and be a winner that night. And, uh, you know, made the call, rings, rings, person picks up. I don't even think I got past the, the words Benedictine University before they hung up. And, <laughs> and the, uh, you know, I'll, I'll always say maybe it was just a disconnection, who knows. But the person sitting next to me just kind of, you know, chuckled and it was more of a, uh, well, you know, welcome to the team type of thing. Like you, you might get that uh, a couple dozen more times tonight, but it really instilled in me, you know, um, that you know, not everybody, uh, you know, wants to, to give to or through their alma mater. Um, but, you know, it's our job to work with those people that do and to help them fulfill those goals. And uh, it also taught me to keep trying, keep trying, you know, uh, the old baseball. No doubt. We'll talk more about, um, I think, how your, your view on the role of fundraiser has evolved um, as you've experienced um, so much success. But one of the... Uh, one of the areas I wanted to press on a little bit is there's obviously a rapid evolution happening um, around what has traditionally been the student calling space. And on one hand, I think it's a great, uh, you know, training grounds. So many current advancement leaders started, uh, you know, in that high velocity, you know, being able to inspire people, being able to quickly get to the point, being able to also handle rejection, so many benefits. But um, for all of the skills developed in that role, I think one of the biggest missed opportunities that we see is the opportunity to also build relationships. And I think that um, given how transactional and how volume oriented that work has been historically, um, you know, what you talked about and why you thought to be the best job on campus was skills experience. But what if it could be skills experience and relationships? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you think about, um, you know, the reality that, you know, even in my own, as a recipient of those calls, I've never heard from that student again. I've never had that student connect with me on LinkedIn. I've never had an actual relationship emerge um, with those student kind of workers. And we're starting to pilot some programs like that at Western Kentucky University and, and other institutions to really try to create a more holistic experience for the student, um, but also make sure that there's actual relationship building being done, not just a transactional solicitation. And that if somebody hangs up on you one time, you can try a second time, a third time. You can try via LinkedIn. You can try via email. You can send people calendar invitations, Zoom links, the same way you and your family will connect um, over the holidays here. And I think, you know, I'd just be curious to get your perspective on the skills experience and potential relationship aspect of that work. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's fantastic. I'm really glad to hear that you guys are working on some of that stuff. I think it's something we all need to integrate into our programs. Um, you know, I can think back to those times at Benedictine where, uh, you know, because I was fortunate to not just be a student caller, but also, you know, work, uh, like I said, during the summers, doing a variety of things for the development office, that kind of happened organically where, you know, I would meet that that donor or that alum who I had called, you know, the semester prior during the golf outing, you know, or, or doing, you know, during just some other event. And 
you know, because they received the handwritten note that I sent following the call, thanking them for making their gift. Um, and I'd introduce myself. And part of the reason I was there was to be a proud, you know, scholarship recipient and to, to you know, shake hands and meet the people who were contributing to my, uh, you know, to my support. Uh, it, you know, it was kind of cool for them to say, hey, you called me, you know, I remember talking to you. How's, you know, I heard the football season was good. Congratulations. And uh, it kind of came full circle. And if, if we can find a way to, you know, actually uh, do that at scale, um, I, I think, you know, it's, it's just going to be all the better, not only for our students, but obviously for our donors and the relationship they have with our organizations. Absolutely. Um, well, I look forward to kind of going on that journey together and, and getting your perspective on it, because I think it does link to, you know, one of the questions we often ask um, in advance of hosting guests is, is there a, a memorable gift story that you'd like to share? You know, when you think about all the gifts you've closed, all the conversations you've been a part of, there's always one or two that stands out for every uh, advancement professional. And uh, you didn't hesitate in sharing what your memorable gift story was. And I think it's really um, poignant this time of year. Yeah, I mean, that was, you know, fairly earlier on as a frontline, you know, uh, development officer, gift officer. Um, I was working on a smaller campaign uh, and I think I was, I think I might've been a leadership gift officer at the time. And uh, it was one of the, the first, you know, uh, I want to say multi-year pledges that I worked with a donor to complete. And, um, you know, it was a big, it was, it was part of their, uh, the donor's class reunion, I believe. And uh, it was for, I think this might've been at the University of Chicago, it was for uh, their, uh, the Odyssey scholarship was, is a, is a, I think it's, you know, still a, a big focus for the Chicago, University of Chicago's fundraising efforts. Um, but it's uh, scholarships for those students who, you know, are from underserved backgrounds and giving them access to the top notch, uh, you know, quality education that UChicago provides. And the donor is just so moved by that. Um, they wanted to commit over a number of, number of years and see their class year scholarship grow. And by the end of you know, working with the donor on this process, I think I may have maybe introduced them to a student or two who had received it in the past. And it, you could just tell how meaningful the experience was to them. They actually thanked me uh, for helping them to do this. And um, you know, at that point, it was like the light bulb kind of switched on. You know, we're not here to close gifts, to get gifts. You know, it, it's, we get lost in that sometimes. We're here to really, uh, you know, help connect people's philanthropic goals to our missions and our visions. And I got that from that experience. I mean, they were thanking me for helping them do that. And uh, it was powerful and it's, it has really stuck with me, you know, uh, until today and, and it'll stick with me for a very long time, I'm sure. So it sounds like by the donor thanking you uh, and, and it kind of changing your perspective on not making the ask, but rather being the facilitator, being the connector between their interests and opportunities for philanthropic impact, it almost gave you more confidence in future donor conversations and probably also helps you understand when there's not that mutual fit, you know, maybe not to press too hard, but when there is a mutual fit, be aggressive, you know, be bold, like don't be afraid to challenge people in helping them make a bigger impact than they might have anticipated they could make. Absolutely. It, I think it, it, it encouraged me to think differently about, you know, who I or who or what I'm providing a service to. Now, obviously, wherever, you know, we are working, whatever, whatever institution we're working on behalf of, you know, we want to serve that institution. But it, it I think, you know, for the first time, I really thought about service to our donors as well. And the service we're providing them is, like you mentioned, that, that facilitation, that connection to the mission in a way that's meaningful to them and helps them accomplish their goals as well. Working as a development officer, right, starting your career in that role, and then uh, you make the leap to University of Chicago. That had to be pretty overwhelming, right? When you just think about how ingrained you were in that community, how many relationships you had, to then take that leap. I mean, what kind of inspired that uh, that move? I mean, obviously close to close to home, um, but was there more to it? Uh, obviously, uh, just a, a different institution. Um, what was it like when you made that leap? Yeah, so you know, the, I think the drive of the leap was um, working at Benedict and working from my alma mater. I came to the conclusion that you know this work was work that 
I was committed to doing, whether it was at Benedictine or another organization. And um, I wanted to really grow and be the best I could be in it. And, you know, part of it is was, you know, because one of my, uh, my supervisor at the time uh, had left to go on to another institution. And, and, uh, you know, I, I think I, it, I was just ready for the next step at that point. And I wanted to go to one of two places where I thought that I could learn the most at the time. And, uh, you know, those two places were either Northwestern University or the University of Chicago. And um, I was hired by UChicago uh, to uh, start on a team that was somewhat new. Uh, it was called the Leader Leadership Cultivation and Stewardship Team. And they were really focused on, you know, cultivating at scale, the, the middle of the, the donor pyramid, as we like to call it. And, uh, you know, I, it was a little overwhelming going from a, a, a university where I, I can't tell you how many staff, you know, faculty and staff are at Benedictine for, for a little bit of perspective. I think there's around 3000 or so, so students. Um, and just, you know, the leap to Chicago where, I mean, it's 10 to 12,000 students, not a too big of a jump, but I think we all know the, the breadth and, and uh, you know, robustness of of the University of Chicago, you know, um, so it was intimidated. And then I got there and I realized, wow, this is, you know, the work that I'm doing is is very much the same. It's just with a different group of people. But, you know, we're still committed to the institution and to serving our donors and connecting them. And so once I realized that uh, it, it, it wasn't as intimidating. That's good to hear, because I'm sure there are folks that right now are working their alma mater where they know all the faculty because they had some of them they know every dean they know everything about it they know what the dining hall is called and what the the meal plan highlights are right i mean you know everything about it and then to take a leap where like the work is the same right it's the same philanthropic work but you know no names you know no buildings right I mean, it's got to be a big learning curve um how do you address that i mean how do you get up to speed on one hand without um uh you know, kind of overthinking it, right. And just getting out there and having the conversations, but also being prepared enough to be able to go a mile wide inch deep. So the donors aren't sort of suspicious of your kind of lack of, of, you know, in-depth knowledge at a new enterprise. How, how do you think about getting up to speed? Yeah. So I'll credit the university of Chicago uh, for sure. They have, you know, from what I remember, a really great onboarding process, I mean, it is it is you know very much a part of of the hiring and onboarding process. They they want you to feel ingrained uh, in the spirit of the university, um, not just in the alumni relations and development uh, division, but you know they want you to know the histories and the traditions, um, so that when you are going out and engaging with you know those proud alumni, you can speak somewhat knowledgeably or you know understand you know just uh, the, the culture that's there. I mean they. You know, uh, one of the common phrases that alumni and many people across the university will will spit out is, you know, that's all well and good in practice, but tell me what it's like in theory. And it just kind of embodies, you know, what the, the tradition of the, of the university is really all about. Um, it's shifting a little bit from that, from what I can remember, but, you know, I, I think that's just representative. So, you know, there's that. But one of the things one of my first supervisors always, always you know, taught me was, you know, in this work, the beauty of it is we go out and we get to figure out what other people care about, you know, what other people are passionate about. And, you know, while I would do my due diligence and trying to understand, you know, uh, you know, what they studied or, you know, what extracurriculars they participated in, I also wanted to go out and just say, hey, what was the experience like for you? You know, what, 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 what did you learn at UChicago that has stuck with you? Or, you know, do you uh, get, you know, communications from us, you know, nowadays? What, what, what are you reading that really makes you, you know, focus on it a little bit more than you would any other, you know, any other piece of email or mail that you're getting? And use that, you know, to connect them back. And, and that's the best form of intelligence gathering I can get. I could sit and, you know, read a ton uh, of our one pagers or, you know, go and talk to a million faculty members before I go out, or I can go out and find out what people care about and then come back and learn more about those areas. And I'd imagine there's an element of just starting in more of a discovery program where you're not going to get a ton of research support, right? You're not going to get all those one pagers. It's a little bit of, you know, here's a list, get after it and let's see what we can learn. And then maybe if somebody, like you said, 
surfaces with significant capacity or significant potential, then you go and do the research. But I do feel like sometimes um, there can be a tension of, of just wanting too much information or just wanting too perfect of a bio before we even make that first step. And so how do you think about kind of balancing a high level of activity and still making sure you know enough about the prospects to be able to engage them with tremendous preparation, which then might delay the actual relationship building activities. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I think it's really dependent on, I think the person and I, my style is just, you know, I I never, I never want to do too much research before I even reach out to a person, you know, I want to reach, I want to do just enough to reach out to a person and, you know, see if I could take them for a cup of coffee in, in normal times, we'll say for a cup of coffee or these days, you know, can we, can we jump on zoom? Um, so how once, do you define just enough? What's like your one, two, three, just enough. Yeah. So I want to know where, you know, if they are uh, philanthropic, I, I want to know where are they making their gifts, right? That's I've I was always taught that where you kind of put your money, that's a vote uh, for your you know passion for that area. Um, so, uh, and, and, and also that's the reason I'm reaching out to them, right? That's, that's my job is to raise money for the institution, but to also thank donors and make sure I'm communicating the impact of their giving. Um, and so when I reach out, you know, one of the first things I want to understand and also share with them, um, is I know that you're giving to this area, you're making an impact in this area. I'd love to talk with you a little bit more to tell you a little bit more about the impact you're making and hear why it's important for you to support that area. If I only have that piece of information, you know, that might just be enough. You know, of course, I want to know what they study when they graduated, but if they made a gift last month to, you know, our student emergency fund, that's more important because it's relevant today, you know, not that they right. studied philosophy right. 35 years ago. <laughs> so. Fair enough. Um, you talk a lot about the importance of communicating the impact of the gift. And even in your own experience at the golf outing, as a student caller, being able to meet somebody in person who supported a scholarship that maybe directly or indirectly benefited you, that improved the communication of the impact. We're not doing a lot of golf outings these days, right? So what are some of the things you're seeing and doing as an institution to help scale the communication of that impact in this digital context that we're all operating in? Yeah, I've seen a lot of innovation digitally. Um, you know, I, our, our own team in particular, we just finished a pretty big uh, digital, I guess, engagement campaign, uh, we'll call it, uh, called Thousand Strong. And uh, that's, a, uh, that's a phrase from our, our alma mater song. Um, and, uh, it, it, you know, it was, a, I think, three days of digital engagement where you know, we were asking people to submit videos telling us why they're proud to be a Husky. You know, we had a 30-minute live kickoff event that featured some very notable, you know, um, NIU alumni that it spoke to the importance in, of alumni pride and Husky pride and how donors are making an impact. And we had over, I believe, 2,000 views at this point on that kickoff show and uh, our day of giving that was the the, the, the second uh, day of that three-day series uh, raised over $2 million. And uh, I, I want to say over 3,000 gifts. So, um, but it doesn't stop there, right? It, 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 it's also now, how are we communicating back that their gifts made a difference? And so I think a lot of, you know, a lot of organizations may stop with that day of giving, but for us, it's now like, okay, you've made this impact, you know, and now we have a series of communications. I made the gift myself, and I got a text message from one of my teammates, you know, thanking me for making the gift and sending me a video that was the highlight of the, the three days. I mean, we have to keep it going. You know, we have to, if we were going to engage them and ask them for gifts uh, one way, we should really think about thanking them and communicating that impact back in the same way. Totally agree. And I think there's so much, you know, if you think about the idea of automation rules, there have always been maybe not automation, but these rules around stewardship, right? If X, Y, Z person gives this level of gift, then this is the society or the experience that they're going to have. But so much of that has been rooted in offline, right? It's been about the dinner. It's been about the golf outing. It's been about the letter from the president. And it's like every single, like the spirit is so spot on. When certain things happen at certain levels, a varying degree of stewardship should occur, 
but every version of that needs to be digitized at this point. And some of that's happening, right? The gift comes in, the text message comes to you from the person who benefits with the video, boom, like that is the kind of thing we need to do more and more consistently. At the same time, I look at these giving days right now, we're on Giving Tuesday today, and you're right, that is oftentimes where it stopped. And the success is we had 3,000 donors, 2 million gifts. And I think the future of the Giving Day from our vantage point is we had 3,000 donors, 2 million in gifts. And of the 3,000 donors, 30 were now moved into assignment of a gift officers. The next 300 were put into portfolios because they have high net worth and they just made a gift. And we were able to generate 10 million of pipeline in the subsequent 12 months mm -hmm. because we were able to identify clear leads out of the giving day. And I think oftentimes there's just too much giving day living in the annual fund. Meanwhile, major gifts going about their work and maybe they do some challenges around the giving day. But how do we really look at Giving Day as a top of giving funnel um, source of intelligence to really support pipeline? I know your team is working on that right now, that you've been thinking about it very much in that manner. And I just like your perspective on that evolution I'm describing in general from finite day to pipeline generation and how you all are thinking about that at your shop. Yeah, I mean, you are totally speaking my language. You're speaking the whole team's language right now. And, you know, fortunately, we have uh, a leader in Catherine Squires that is really encouraging us to to think this way and empowering many people on the team to move these things forward. Um, so, like you said, I mean, Thousand Strong was a great way for us to, you know, engage, to share, you know, unique stories. Um, but you know, it doesn't stop there. Now, you know, we, we, we already had this thing, these, these things factored in to our next steps. You know, how do we follow up with these people? Who follows up with these people at our organization? And, you know, what did they respond to? What resonated with them on that particular day? And how do we continue to engage them in that particular area or that type of story moving forward? Because they've, they've raised their hand and said that that matters to me, you know, and, uh, you know, that will be included Know, coded in, in every way possible so that we can, you know, make meaningful connections and, you know, it just doesn't stop. We have to continue, you know, moving this, you know, like you said, through the funnel. Love it. Uh, well, I, I look forward to seeing how that work evolves for you. I know you're in the midst of crunching data uh, right now. And, uh, and I think uh, everybody listening, it, ju it just should be, I think that kind of system. We had a thousand donors, the top 50, here's what happened with them. The top 250 after that, here's what happened with them. And then maybe our traditional broad-based stewardship still applies uh, deeper in the giving pyramid because you can only be so personalized with so many people. But I think we can be more personalized with many more donors than we are currently. Uh, and I know NIU is focused on that right now. I mean, when you think about just the innovation that you've experienced this year, right? Having been a frontline officer, I'm sure you um, have have done all of the discovery visits, the, you know, all of the try to book the meeting, get out there, do the filler uh, visits on top of it. Um, you know, what was it like for you? Any, any, I mean, I know you were embracing video, et cetera, but what's your perspective on the way donors have been willing to embrace some of these new technologies, um, you know, in your own interactions or your team's interactions this year? Have you been surprised? Have you been excited? Is there maybe more friction than I, than I realize? No, not from, from my perspective, and, and I think my team would agree. I think, you know, the, you know, the outcome of the, the, the pandemic is, unfortunately, we've all had to adapt to this, this, you know, different way of communicating and engaging. And so I think, you know, because of that, it, it is better received by some of our, you know, donors uh, that I'm asking you for a Zoom visit instead of taking you, you know, out for a cup of coffee. And so it's understood. Um, if we were doing this outside of, you know, this unfortunate event we're all dealing with, I, I don't, it made a video, you know, probably would have taken a lot longer for people to get comfortable enough to speed in that regard. But uh, I also think that, you know, from what I can tell, they, they really appreciate the value that these platforms have created, this innovation has created. You know, we just signed on with ThankView. And um, I can tell you, it's made a tremendous impact uh, from, from our donor base. Um, as well as our gift officers being able to, you know, really create a, a quality donor experience for those uh, individuals. I'm able to connect them with recipients of their scholarships where I would have never been able to do that, you know, or at least I wouldn't have thought that I would have been able to do that. But now my way of thinking. Right. Tell me about different. that. Like, tell me about that, because I think it makes so much sense. But this idea of creating that golf course experience that you had 
digitally. How are you doing that? What are the processes in place? How streamlined is it? I know Thankview has been working hard in that regard. We're obviously integrating Thankview engagement data into the Evertrue platform. But when, it, when you're actually seeing it operationalized, what's going really well? And then if you could wave a magic wand over Evertrue and Thankview, what could we be doing to make it even easier? Yeah, I, you know, I don't, um, I don't know that there's anything that can be done to make it easier. I think that whatever, everything, the feedback I'm getting back from my, my team is that it's so intuitive. It's so easy to use. The connectivity is, is fantastic. Um, you know, I think it, it's, uh, I haven't done this myself, but I believe that the, the report, the contact report just goes straight into Evertrue from thank you. I mean, how much easier can you make it for us, for, you know, people who, are terrible at doing contact reports, right? Like gift officers are always terrible at doing contact reports. Um, and that's just so easy. And so, you know, my team really focuses on, uh, we, you know, we focus on, on strategies and, and, and structures for moving uh, relationships forward with donors. And it's, it's nice to be able to, to plan when, uh, you know, a certain donor's fun, I'll give you an example donor who I'm working with, they, they have a fund that's focused on student engagement and experiential learning. And so uh, these students, you know, it, it's funds that can support research, artistry, you know, hands-on learning activities that is really student driven. And, you know, before to really demonstrate at that impact, I could send them the donor a few photos and maybe a little narrative. Now I can send the, the students a video and ask them, Hey, can you do a you know a quick you know three minute kind of poster presentation? Um, I'd love to be able to share this with the the, the donors to your fund, um, and the donor gets that. And they but like how do you know. how, like literally to the level Ray of like how do you know what the student's email or phone number is? I mean, do you have that all kind of connected in like a recipient management system? Um, because like that is exactly the kind of experience we should be creating for ideally every single donor, right? And I think that's where I just see like even some of those manual steps that you're doing, mm -hmm. how could we just automatically create triggers? So like if gift comes in from that donor, this is the beneficiary, boom, will you please send, uh, you know, a, a video sharing like the impact and like, it's, it's great to hear that we're getting there, but it's like, how do we continue to reduce the friction and scale the depth of that level of engagement? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I don't think we're there yet. Um, I know my colleague, I'll name drop a little bit, Diane Johnson, who works uh, with our donor relations and stewardship program. I mean, she's fantastic at, at really trying to uh, make that this process more seamless. So we have an internal kind of form that we fill out that's really easy to fill out. And uh, her team manages the deployment, the gathering of the student information, and the turnaround time is, is super quick. Um, and so we, we are definitely so literally like a simple, that. almost like a simple Google form or something, just like make your request. The request gets routed by donor relations. The video then comes back to you and then you're able to share it with the donor or does the video come from the student to the donor directly? I'm curious how it works today. Yeah. So the video uh, comes to, you know, me in this case for kind of final just approval. Um, and then I have, you know, depending on what my, uh, you know, thought is I can send the, the video myself or it can come from the NIU foundation uh, email address. Got it. It's really just dependent on our perspective, but it is such a seamless process. And uh, I appreciate my team for working on that. I, I love this race so much because I feel like we are on the cusp of just some like a, a year from now where we could be with all of this behavior change and the adaptation, the technology like what you just described for the student, like let's scale that up the pyramid, right? Imagine if every day deans were cranking out 15 30 second thank you videos, right? And the president was cranking out 100 30 second videos per week or per month. Like this whole idea of I'm gonna hand sign all of the letters and you know put them in the mail, et cetera. I feel like we are really, really close. And I think it means part of the opportunity for frontline officers is how can you be that orchestrator? Right. You don't have to necessarily be the star of the show all the time if you can weave together those compelling digital experiences by pulling in faculty, pulling in students and making it so simple for them. I mean, you're in the Midwest, right? Cameo is based in Chicago. And I feel like what Cameo is doing for consumer engagement, like there is a donor version of that using our own campus celebrities in the same manner. Absolutely. 
Yeah, we, you know, we try and do that, uh, you know, across the board, faculty, staff, uh, our president is, is definitely one of those leaders who understands the importance of it and wants to do it. I mean, she thinks it's cool to, you know, do the, 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 the video messages to donors. Um, and so I think we've just really, you know, we're at the tip of the iceberg for what the possibilities are. I think obviously this is a time that is really for forcing organizations to innovate. And I think we're a part of that and we'll continue to do it. Let's talk about that a little bit because even pre-COVID, I would say that our team at Evertrue, right, we've worked together for, for some time um, and with you and with many of your colleagues, we just always cite NIU as being an, an organization that really does want to innovate, that really does kind of want to push, not in a kind of reckless, let's go chase every new idea, but in a really pragmatic manner. Why is that? Does that come from the president? Does it come from your advancement leadership? Because it, it can be hard to change in this higher ed sector, but it seems like there's always been more of a willingness at NIU, and I'm curious where that comes from. I, I mean, I can hands down say it's leadership. I'd say it's the, our leadership of the university, uh, President Freeman, and the leadership of our foundation, uh, Catherine Squires. Um, it, it's it, it, from the day I stepped foot on campus, it, it was you know it was very much that you know we want to engage, we want to you know connect donors in a mean, meaningful way, we want to reconnect alumni in a meaningful way. Um, it it, it you know, comes down to the leadership, I think, just all across the board and. It's because we we want to do that. We want to provide a top-notch alumni and donor experience, and uh, we also want to uh, secure more funds, more uh, opportunities, more connections for our students. We're a very mission-driven organization, and I realize most places, you know, will say that, but we're all about social mobility and innovation of our students, right? And so we have over 50% of our students are first generation. Um, you know, many underserved uh, students and the strength of the work that we do in reconnecting one of our best assets, which are our alumni and, and friends, um, it really results in, in better opportunities, better outcomes for our students. Will there ever be a day, Ray, when you plan your year and you're thinking about the hundred visits you should have to go see a certain number of donors, or maybe it's 50 visits. I mean, how different do you think the world of frontline fundraising will be two years from now than it is today? I mean, today we have no choice, right? But we will have choice in the future around what kind of strategies, what kind of process do we use based on different parts of the giving pyramid, et cetera. I mean, do you have a point of view on just how you've seen your own behavior change, donor behavior change? Where might things level out a year or two from now? Yeah, I think, you know, we'll get we'll get back to a point where we're seeing people in person again. I think, you know, as much as I enjoy Zoom and and phone calls, um, I do miss sitting across from people uh, a lot of the time. Um, but I think that, you know, my, my team has, has really kind of moved towards this. We, we need to be looking more so at the quality of the, the interaction. And that's actually what we measure. We don't measure pure visits. We, we measure quality interactions. And uh, there's a variety of things that that go into that and what that means uh, for us. Um, but that could be a phone call, you know, that could be a Zoom conversation. Um, you know, did it help you understand better about what the donor really cares about, what they might want to support, or how do we engage them moving forward? If you can check that box, you know, I don't care if it happened on Zoom or or by phone. That's a quality interaction. Um, yeah, I, I love that that description because I think. Um, yeah, quality interaction. I mean, we've been talking just about the idea of a conversation, right? It used to be about a visit. Now it's about a conversation. Conversation can happen via text. Conversation can happen via LinkedIn message. Conversation can happen on the telephone. Conversation can happen via Zoom. Like it's about the conversation. Are we having quality conversations where we're learning, we're advancing, we're stewarding, et cetera? Um, and and I, I, I do feel like when you think about all the friction that there was previously, around having a quality conversation with somebody so much of that friction has been reduced and i hope that we try to keep it as low as possible coming out of covid mm -hmm. i'm totally in any areas um you know when you think about where the sector is over investing and under investing yeah uh you know over investing just kind of going back to where we just ended uh i think that you know 
visits and, and, you know, jumping on a plane or just driving, you know, for us, you know, from DeKalb to Chicago, 65 mile drive, uh, you know, it's definitely going to be more of a consideration moving forward, even when we are able to meet in person, uh, you know, in order to be really good stewards of the, the, the finances, the funds that we are afforded, um, we have to ask ourselves, you know, can we have this Zoom conversation, you know, instead? Um, and I think that's, you know, it's going to be a definite, you know, consideration. It's going to be worked into the process moving forward, yeah. for sure. Yeah, I think that comment about being a good steward of the resource while not sacrificing the donor journey, I mean, that's sort of sort of the tension. But I do feel like if you've listened to the podcast, you're going to hear me say this probably over and over. I'll get on little kind of broken record type rants. But we were talking with Catherine Van Sickle at Columbia, who also runs a podcast, and she was saying that they budget $1,500 per trip on average across mm -hmm. the year for Columbia, okay? And um, it might be lower when you're driving more often than they might be there, but um, right now, we're now budgeting $0 per Zoom interaction. And is there not an opportunity to find a happy medium where maybe we could budget 50 or 100 or $200 to still great, create great donor experiences, but that, that revenue, that, uh, that expense doesn't go to airlines and hotels. It goes to something that maybe could more meaningfully um, impact the donor journey, right? Maybe we start uh, buying uh, uh, dinners for students to join in a conversation where it's a virtual conversation. So now we paid uh, 30 bucks for that student to eat. We paid 30 bucks for the donor to eat, you know, ourselves. And like for a hundred dollars, we could create something that's intimate and almost frictionless, but, um, but more than $0 by way of zoom. So I'm curious if you've given any thought to what investments can you make to complement zoom to create maybe a, a more cost effective, but still less than free uh, or sorry, more than free type uh, interaction. Yeah, I don't, you know, I, I'll be totally honest. I just don't know if we're there yet, um, but it's definitely a part of the, the, the consideration, not just for, you know, how we engage with alumni and donors, but also how we hire, you know, it's, it's going to influence, it's going to change what our, our uh, you know, prospective uh, candidate pool looks like. There's, there's a little bit of a broader scope there, which is great, you know, for us, one of the challenges, like I mentioned, of where we're located is we're in the Chicago area, but we're, we're 65 miles west. Um, but, you know, this definitely opens up and reduces any, any type of physical location barrier. You know, if you're in Chicago, fine, stay in Chicago. I mean, most of our alumni are out that way anyway. Um, but, you know, we'd love you to come to campus when we can and experience all of the, you know, the Husky community. Um, but we also realize you can do this from your home. You know, you can do this from, you know, uh, the, the beach. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's definitely going to be a, a change. I think change for the better. I love it. Um, and so, you know, let's just talk a little bit about, you know, team, right? Because you just talked about remote everything as it relates to engagement. Are you all thinking about remote talent yet? Maybe not there, but how do you think about having, you know, even when we are in more of a hybrid, um, you can visit people in person mode. I mean, are there communities that you would look at today and say, wow, if we had somebody who was kind of fully stationed in XYZ community or XYZ part of Chicago, it would completely reduce travel friction and all that traffic pain that I'm sure you've navigated as much as anybody. Um, but it would also create an opportunity for both broader access to talent, uh, you know, the ability to engage with donors locally via Zoom, but also going and seeing them locally. I mean, any thoughts on the future of talent? And also, are you hiring at NIU right now? Yeah, well, we're definitely hiring. Uh, there's should to be some positions that we have up now, and uh, I think there's more to come as well. Um, and then in terms of, you know, how we're sourcing and looking for talented individuals at this point, you know, I, I can say that even pre-pandemic, it, it was in the conversation, you know, nothing's off the table. We do have some, while the majority of our alumni are in the Midwest, uh, we do have some uh, heavily populated areas in California, Florida, um, and so I, you know, we haven't really picked that up in a very, you know, uh, in a big way yet, but I have a feeling it's coming, you know, and, and this, this, uh, techn these technologies are just going to accelerate that conversation and probably make it a lot easier for us to make those decisions moving forward. I think there are a lot of people out there that could get on board with being a fundraiser in Chicago all summer long, mm -hmm. and then you head down to Naples all winter long. So we can really kind of, uh, you know, uh, meet our donors where they are, but also 
you know, get out of that Chicago winter. I don't, I don't know. You. Well, I mean, it's Chicago <laughs> winters are, they get a bad rap. They're beautiful, I guess, pre, you know, or before Christmas. Um, and then after January 1st, it's like, wait, why is it this cold? But I'll say, I, you know, I'll say that Chicago to me, and I'm a little biased, but it is the best place to spend a summer uh, in the world. It's just amazing. I'm right there with you. It is just, uh, it, it's incredible. I've spent some formative years there. And it's just a lot. Um, okay, so we're going to wrap up here shortly. We're all getting ready for Thanksgiving. I've got to figure out how to do a sous vide turkey in an RV. So I've got some work cut out for me here the next uh, next day or so. But I also, uh, you had a comment in your um, in your questionnaire about being the luckiest guy in the world. And so in the spirit of gratitude this week, why are you the luckiest guy in the world? Well, uh, I'm very, very lucky, luckiest guy in the world, because my now wife uh, took a chance on me a few years ago and married me. And, you know, I definitely married up, I'll say. And, uh, I, you know, we, we were married in 2014 and one daughter and, you know, uh, and six years later, we're still happy and you know, still, still, uh, still living, living the dream, I guess, as they say. So. Well, look, it has been a uh, you know challenging year uh, on many fronts, but it's great to see you smiling, happy, and I just had to tee you up to be able to answer that, and I will make sure to share a snippet of that last comment with you so you can send it right over uh, to her. But, um, you know, in all seriousness, you all have been great partners at NIU. You specifically have been a great partner. Um, there is some serious beach soccer going on behind oh, yeah. you, so I apologize to everybody for the background noise. We figure we just take a chance with the outdoor recording today. Um, and, uh, Ray, keep up the great work. Congratulations on the momentum. Keep innovating, uh, and, uh, have a terrific Thanksgiving. All right. Thanks so much, Brent. Appreciate it. Appreciate the partnership. I mean, you guys have been fantastic. And I think I say this to you every time we connect on LinkedIn, you know, keep pushing us, you know, and I don't just mean NIU, I mean the whole industry. We need it. We will. We will, man. There's too much opportunity not to, uh, and too much impact waiting to be, to be made, um, if we can help people like you connect donors with their uh, interests and passions, um, it, it's pretty special. So uh, with that, with a lot of gratitude, Brent here signing off in Newport Beach with the uh, Thanksgiving episode of the Rays podcast. Take care.